Are you tired of chasing clients for documents? Or even worse, your team wasting countless hours searching for things across multiple different platforms? Do you want a way to work with your clients 19 times faster than email? How about having an average response time from clients of only six minutes? Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Lysio, later in the episode. And here's the thing I think we don't think about enough in accounting is when you're self-employed, the nice thing about working all that time is that comes to you. You make the profits, right? Yeah. You, so you're incentivized to work really hard, better than at a firm where they're just, the profits go to the partners. But there's a cost to that, which is you're not healthy because you can't go work out if you're working those 10 plus hours, the, t- the quarter of people who work 10 plus hours a day, I don't know how you work out or do you have a family? Like, how do you spend time with your family? How do you do all that stuff? Because I haven't personally figured that out. Coming to you weekly from the OnPay Recording Studio, this is the Cloud Accounting Podcast. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Man, David, it's been a morning for me. I got to tell you. uh, What happened? I was driving to breakfast. I think both you and I have had issues with our cars recently. You not getting one and then me mangling mine. But no, I, I would, put mine broke last week or the week before. My my the new the new car. My belt, like I, I my battery went dead. Couldn't figure out why. I go into the shop. They're like, you don't even have a belt. I was like, oh, <laughs> great. So. On the on the Mach E, the new one. No, no, no. The oh. Mach E has no parts. It's just a cell phone with wheels. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you got that car. Well, so anyway, I was driving my car to breakfast because you know I wanted to go out and have a nice uh, a burrito, a breakfast burrito, so that I have plenty of energy to do this show. And I pull into the parking lot and I, I take a quick right and I don't see the curb and the curb has obviously been missed by lots of people so it's very sharp you know how curbs get sharpened because it's in the wrong spot yeah and so I hit the curb and like two flat tires two, two? flat tires yes both the front oh, and the back yeah oh. so <laughs> how'd you get out of that my, that was my morning uh luckily I'm close by so I was able to get home and now I'm doing this show but anyway I'm excited to be talking the show with almost you. did not happen then the show, the, the show could have possibly not happened, but you know, the show must go on. So I'm yes. here. I'm ready to talk accounting and tech. Um, I don't have anything super burning this week. I'm, I'm actually hoping to catch up on some stories that I've been stockpiling. How about you? I have a lot of app news, and I just have two stories that aren't. But I think one thing we should acknowledge, um, the, the final day has came and gone. And as uh, uh, Adam Markowitz put it on Twitter, He's been using that hashtag March Eternity. March right? Eternity, it's, it's, yeah. It's finally over. So since March 2020, he counted 961 painful days. And he has a whole Twitter thread about how it went through all the different acts, right? And then on top of PPP and ERCs, and then there was um, 74,397 um, interim final rules. And who knows if final rules ever came out for anything. And it just he just goes on and on about how this is probably never going to be like this again. Like the amount, the volume of legislation and acts and stimulus and yeah. that's has ha- that has happened starting with COVID really probably will not happen again in our careers. Um, Almost a and, thousand you know, days. So congratulations, everybody. Yeah. You made it. <laughs> you made it. Uh, well, where do we start? Where do we start today, David? I've got stories about, there's actually one from Tom Herbert who we saw at, Intact, uh, Sage Transform, the Intact conference, the Sage conference. He has a story, uh, is accounting as a platform, the future of the profession. There's some interesting things going on in the UK, similar to what we've got here going on with TurboTax Live and and QuickBooks Live, um, you know, firms that are software companies, but also providing services. We've, of course, got updates on uh, Microsoft. Shopify added tax to their product. There's some changes with crypto on tax forms. I've got work from home stories. I've got, oh, a story about that fan who caught the Aaron Judge historic home run and the tax consequences of that. I don't know. Like, where do we start? Like, what? Well, start with the oldest article that you've been, that somehow just keeps making it to the next week and the next week. It never makes the cut, but it it's, makes the cut to the next week. Hmm. Like, start with your oldest one. Uh, well, my oldest one was, it's it's almost kind of out of date now where it's it's it's, the headline is, Remote work drove over 60% of U.S. house price surge, Fed study finds. This was in Bloomberg. 
Can you uh, repeat that headline again? I want to make sure I'm yeah. following. So remote work drove yep. over 60% of the U.S. house price surge. Oh, got, yeah. that makes sense, right? What? I'm people, working at home. I need more house. I need bigger house. I need an extra room. I need an office. And also people like me who moved from high rent areas to low rent areas and bought houses instead of renting. And yeah. we drove up prices as we moved from LA to Phoenix, for example, which was my situation. But there were also people who moved from New York City out to more suburban areas that drove up prices and all the all the areas around, right? And Austin got a huge influx of people from San Francisco. Yep. So the study was done by the San Francisco Fed and the University of California, San Diego. Uh, and uh, they said that home prices rose 24% in the two years ended November 2021. More than 60% of that 24% increase is attributable to the rise in work from home during the pandemic, a trend that has persisted with 30% of work still being done from home as of last month. So every 1% increase in remote work results in a 0.9 percentage point increase in housing prices, according to their research. Is this... They're going to, I'm going to, you know, there's all the logic things, right? Mm -hmm. like, is this just one of those two things like, well, baby calves were being born and that's caused the curse. Is it just because the two lines oh, are? Correlation rather correlation. than causation? Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I don't know. I didn't dig that far into it. But to me, I feel like it's very causation. Like, I mean, I, I caused, you know, this, I helped to cause this. So, and I see other people in my neighborhood who came from California, you know, now those signs that say, don't California, my Arizona, really mean something. <laughs> you take those personal? <laughs> you don't see a lot of them, but I, I laugh when I see them. I've got more, I don't know, remote work stories. This is a fun one. Would you take a pay cut in exchange for a 40-hour work week in a beachside locale? So David, let me put that question to you. I mean, you don't really have a regular job anymore now that you're a professional podcaster, but pretend yeah, there's you're- There's not much cut. There's not much room to cut, so. <laughs> pretend, pretend you're still at Intuit with your golden handcuffs on, you know, making that good into it money, uh, 18 years there, 20 years there, whatever. And they offered you to go work at a beachside resort, but, and you'd only have to work 40 hours a week. See, I don't know how much you were working before, but let's say, let's say they cut your hours in half and you get to go work at a beachside resort. Would you take a comparable pay cut? A like, say and how 40%. much is the pay cut? Uh, it was, uh, well, in this example, it's 40%. It's about almost half. Half. Almost half. Yeah. Let's just use that. Now, are they so, paying for the resort? Is this a nice? Uh, that is resort? not clear. But let's say it's in an area where it's very cheap. Like the cost of living is at least half. Also, so you're getting you're working half as many hours. You're getting paid half as much, and your cost of living is half as much. Would you take that? I probably not yet. But these three kids are almost in college, and it's very attractive. Like, <laughs> like if you're not locked down, it's a very attractive deal. Well, this is the offer that Citigroup is making to young analysts who typically, when they're in, in investment banking, work 60 to 80 hours a week. And that has proven less and less popular with 20-somethings, with young people. They don't want to work the crazy hours that uh, you know their predecessors did. And so investment banking is having a hard time trying to recruit people into it. Citigroup's trying something new. So they're, they're saying instead of working those 60, 80 hours a week, you're going to work normal 40-hour work weeks. We're also going to let you work from Malaga, Spain, M-A-L-A-G-A, -A -A. Malaga, Spain, uh, a beautiful city on the southern coast known for its food, culture, and lovely weather. Uh, this is the EMEA Banking Analytics Group. They received over 3,000 applications, even though pay is about half as much as their peers that are not working at the beach. But isn't and, this going to drive up the cost of living and home prices there? Well, yeah, People I guess it's related, right? There. It will raise... Well, yeah, maybe. So anyway, they got 3,000 applications, and the in initial cohort is 27 analysts, representing 22 nationalities and 15 languages. And the reason I brought this to the show is because I feel like this is the offer that many cloud-based firms are making to accountants successfully. They're saying, yes, you could go work for a traditional firm and you could work the long hours, or you could come work for us. You're not going to make as much, but we're going to let you work remote. You'll be able to go to a low cost of living area and you'll have a reasonable work week. So 
do you think oh, this thought went off for me this morning? I was listening to the an NPR podcast, and they were talking about the shortage of vets. Like you can't get there's not enough vets. To, like veterinarians, veterinarians right? for dogs and but for cats. animals, and especially in remote towns. Mm-hmm. Like in the city, in like a lot of cities, at least there's a 24 hour vet available. Maybe in a city, and if you had a vet practice, you could maybe limit your hours. But they're all overworked. No, and again, it's young people quitting. So they have a lot of people entering, but they have huge turnover. You know, similar to other professions we might know, like accounting, right? Yeah. There's lots and lots of high turnover. But do you think some of this is an age? Is it an age and demographic, uh, demographic and a values thing, like truly long term values, or is it? A lot of these people have not ever seen a tough day in their life. And in the, the if the economy gets really tight, let's say we go into a depression, like their attitudes might change and be like, hell yeah, I need a job. I'll work 60 hours a week. Like, yeah. I was thinking about that when I was driving around the car because the, the, the one veterinarian in Juneau, Alaska is just like, come on. She, he, to some extent, he thinks it's a very privileged point of view. Right. Kind of privileged and spoiled. Right. And I see that. And I kind of empathize or sympathize with both points of view. One is- yeah. This to get good at what you do, especially in something like accounting or finance or, or medicine or whatever, to be a, a really good professional, you have to like really put a lot of sweat into it. You have to work hard. And the same in music, actually. You know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm for a musician. If you don't work and everything, the, everything is yeah, work. Everything, right? Like, so it's like yeah. the people who aren't willing to work are the ones who tend to fail. And like so you look at the younger generation. And they're not, they don't want to work those long hours. They want to put in the sweat and you say, oh, these guys are lazy, right? These, these young Gen Zers are lazy. They don't want to work hard. Uh, But then at the same time, you know, I'm sort of in the middle. I'm, I'm a millennial. I'm in the middle of that Gen X boomer group that work their butts off. And then there's the Gen Zers who don't want to work at all. And, and the Gen Zers can like have leverage because there's a shortage of workers, right? So they can demand it. But also I sympathize with them because the, the thing you're working for is so out of reach these days. So the American dream, right? The house in suburbia, yeah. the single family home, the nuclear family, the dog, the cars. It's so expensive that it's completely out of reach for the vast majority of Americans these days in major metro areas, which is where most people yep. live now. And so why would I work my ass off if I can't have the things? And so that's and then on top of that, you're not seeing like we talked about a couple of weeks ago with the firms. If if you're a young employee at a company, and you're like, oh, the guy worked so hard for 20 years and now owns the firm, or maybe is a partner, or owns the uh, veterinary practice, is still working 60 hours a week. <laughs> He's not enjoying his life or her life yet. What's the point, right? And yeah. I think there's some of that mindset. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Canopy. Did you know that Canopy has a partnership with the IRS? This means that you can now use Canopy to pull your client transcripts. The integration is approved by the IRS and can be configured to automatically pull transcripts you can easily monitor if and when something changes. Now here's the best part. Once you have your client's transcripts, you can use Canopy's notices feature to help you resolve your client's notices. Canopy has a library of 350 plus pre-built federal and state notice templates that provide an overview of the notice type, as well as walk you through the recommended steps to resolution. And Canopy can even create and autofill your IRS response letters. Canopy also integrates with QuickBooks Online, Xero, FreshBooks, CRMs, Form Builders, Spreadsheets, Calendars, Email, and Zapier. They even have a mobile app, centralized file management, fillable PDFs, a client portal, task management, and the list goes on and on. To get a demo of Canopy and to receive a $40 Amazon gift card, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Canopy. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-A-N-O-P-Y. And actually, this is a great transition because I have an article by our friend Ed Menlowitz exactly on that topic, David. He wrote about this this week. Um, but before I get to Ed, Ed, I want to talk about my own experience which was at a large firm, which, you know, I, I sold my small practice and I went to work for a big firm because I thought they're going to teach me how it's done. I'm going to really yeah. learn how to do this and I'm going to be a partner. And I washed out of there within a year. And one of the reasons that I left, I don't know if we're all washed out is the word. I washed myself out, right? <laughs> I left. But one of the reasons I left is because uh, one of the partners, the youngest partner was like in his mid thirties. He wasn't much older than me at the time. I think he was in his mid thirties. And he was a really hard worker. He was really good with people. He was really good at all the things you need to be good at as a partner, managing. But 
he was trying to buy a house in LA, not too far from the office. Yeah. He could not find a home. He could not afford, as a partner in a top 25 accounting firm, could not afford to buy a house in a neighborhood that would require him to commute less than half an hour. I mean, that's And you're an accountant, crazy. so you start doing the math, and you're like, this doesn't like, make sense. Wh- right, it, so, it doesn't pass the spreadsheet test, right? Yeah, so you're looking up to this guy, and he's working the 60, 80 hours a week. You know, you put yourself in the, in the shoes, and you're like, well, why would I work that hard if I can't get the, the, the treasure, if I can't get what is promised, right? Yeah. So I think that's part of the problem. And so I'm glad we're talking about this because I just read an article this morning uh, by Ed Menlowitz in Accounting Today. And, you know, he's uh, been a partner at, I think it's with them, is it? Uh, he had his own firm. They merged in. He's, he's famous. He writes every week. He's incredibly prolific. He, he's written uh, like 5,000 blog posts or something. It's, it's insane. <laughs> he's been on my Earmark podcast. Um, and he's that was a really off- good interview, by the way. Everybody should listen to it. He's great because he's like an old school partner, but he also has a lot of insight. And so I like to argue with him, but also I learn a lot from him. And this is one of those things I agree with him on. So I'll just read some of the highlights. So this is uh, from his Art of Accounting series on Accounting Today. The importance of being or appearing calm is the headline. This is the final day of the 2022 tax season and a period when many tax staff give notice. Recently, I had a few calls from partners complaining about good staff leaving as of today or the end of the month. They were upset, but after listening to them, I tended to agree with the staff people and here are my comments. To start, here's the context of these calls. These were staff people working for at least four years for the same firm who had advanced rapidly and satisfactorily and whose work was exceptional. Most were leaving to work at other CPA firms or going to private in a similar or slightly elevated capacity at another company. Those that left were at all levels of experience. Some started with the firm and others joined after working at a few other firms, but they were at the job they were leaving for at least four years. They all gave reasonable notice and reasonable reasons, but not what I think were the real reasons. There was a common thread. Each person who gave notice had a boss or immediate superior that was overworked, always behind, always too busy for general or in-depth discussions about the issues or the clients or overall situations. All instructions were hurried and something to get out of the way with many not fully explaining everything that needed to be done or forgetting about important info they should have told employees about. Everything seemed to be a rush, even routine, recurring work, and scheduling was quickly changed at the last minute to get other work that was improperly scheduled completed. Partially completed work was overloading to-do lists with constant apologizing to clients. No day could be planned the day before. Keep in mind that these people liked the work, the clients and their bosses, but they did not like the untenable, pressure-filled, unstable working conditions. Some needed staff under them but weren't permitted to hire their own assistants, and their boss's involvement was always pushed forward. Those in public accounting saw their boss's situations becoming theirs if they remained and made it to partner but didn't want to emulate them. Money was not the primary driver for leaving, although every employer offered to match and then add something to the new salaries their departing staff would be getting. So what is the takeaway from this? Ed says, Bosses are responsible for maintaining an atmosphere of calm, control, and staff support. You are your own worst enemy. You are the role model of what many of your staff will aspire to. Ask yourself if you would enjoy working for you. So ultimately, if I'm hearing this correctly, yes, the ICPA, everybody can do all the stuff they want to do. We can get rid of the 150-hour rule. We can get over, It doesn't matter. We can do all this. But people are really mostly affected by their direct manager at the firm they work for. Like That's probably going to influence your decision and your career more than all this other stuff we talk about all the time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, that's the vibe I'm getting from this. And that's, I think, every job. If you have yeah, a good boss, it doesn't matter where you work. It's going to be a good job as an employee. I feel like most of the time, right? Even really terrible jobs, if you have a good boss, it's good. And, and the problem here is that the staff are looking at their bosses, the partners, and they're seeing the partners are not in a good place. They're busy, they're yeah. hurried, they're overworked. Why would I want to be a partner? Right? So we have to solve this. We can't be busy all the time and and be miserable ourselves if we want to have staff that stick around. They're not going to want to take over. And so how do we solve that? How do we be less busy? Um, I don't know. Well, Jennifer Wilson was on Laurelyn uh, Wilson's podcast. 
No relation. The, no relation. Okay. The, so Laura, uh, Jennifer is the founder of Convergence Coaching and has been preaching remote work for decades, it seems like. And, you know, the pandemic proved her 100% right. <laughs> so like, if anyone was a thought leader in our profession, it's Jennifer Lee Wilson. And um, she was on Laurelyn's show, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Go subscribe to that. It's a great episode. She was on that show talking about how, you know, firms need to go fire clients. And the episode is called National Fire Some Clients Day. And that's one way to build capacity in your firm so that you don't have these crazy situations where you're overworked and over hurried, right? You can't help everybody, you know, and think about it, not just from your own standpoint, it's not just about profit. It's about creating an environment in your firm where you have time to, to just breathe. So uh, that's one way to do it. This, this kind of ties into that. Canopy had a survey where they surveyed 150 accountants in the U S and pretty much 70% of the accountants said that it's easier to get a response from a client than coworkers. I saw that. And, and that's true. But and the, the two other stats I thought were amazing. This coincidentally, they're both 37%, which is kind of interesting, but 30% of accountants say that they have missed a client deadline because of poor office staff communication. And then 37% said they've missed important information because their firm uses too many communication channels, which is interesting. Too many communication channels. So you already have channels. chaos, then you add too many communication channels. Yeah. And that Oh, help either. I mean, we didn't have Slack or Teams when I was there, and it was all email threads. And the way people would try to deal with keeping everyone on the same page was to just keep CCing more and more people into every thread until you had like five to 10 people on every email thread. And it like just became- Congratulations. And everybody else says, congratulations. Please remove me from this thread. And everybody's like, please remove me from this thread. I don't know how those work. Yeah. It just became impossible to keep track of it. So yeah. And I know a lot of firms are still kind of operating that way, right? They, they don't even have teams. I mean, you know, get, get a chat tool or, or get some sort of asynchronous collaboration tool. So that- Or in your workflow. Like, I mean, we're using Process Street now for our own stuff. And being able to chat about the task at hand right next to the task at hand is huge. Yeah. Right. In context, right? Yes, in context. In context, yeah. Because like, why leave the tool you're using to go chat about something to, to tell them, hey, in the tool we're using over here that you have to go back into and look at, here's a screenshot of what I'm talking about. It's just, it, yeah, if you... If, yeah. Just, Chat in maybe maybe standalone chat things are gonna all die because chatting in context in the actual app or workflow is really the better experience by far. But, and this is what we've said for a while, David. It's like why why can't I in QuickBooks or in NetSuite or in whatever tax software I'm using, why can't I mention people like when I'm looking at something and have a little yeah. chat sidebar open up so that they can see what I'm seeing and we can talk about that thing? Why do I have to even have Teams or Slack? Right? I mean, we 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 pretty much through our we've stopped using Slack. I know you, we kind of have Google Chat, but I try to avoid using it with you because I'd rather just chat in the things. So it's starting to, yeah, starting maybe, to come. maybe you won't need these other tools. You just as long as you're the tools you the other tools you select have chat built in. Now, if you're on old legacy desktop stuff, they're never going to get this. Like maybe it's time to move on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Lysio. I have to admit, I love email, but as soon as I'm in the zone, heads down, focused, working on a task, something may require me to go look at a related email to the task at hand. I jump over, open my inbox, and just like that, I get distracted and derailed by hundreds of other unrelated emails. By the time I find the email I was looking for, I've wasted a half hour or more. If you and your team are still using email to communicate with your clients, I suspect you have a story similar to mine. Even if you don't, using email with your clients is probably a bad idea. It's like sending postcards back and forth. Anyone can read, not very secure. And let's admit it, clients are probably ignoring your emails anyways. Maybe it's time to move all your client communications out of your email inbox and into Lysio. Lysio allows you to have secure, real-time communications with your clients via a mobile app that includes reminders, task management, e-signatures, document scanning and uploading, and unlimited storage. With everything inside of Lysio, your team can just focus on the task for each client and won't need to jump between email inboxes and other tools to get work done. And if they need to communicate with a client, they can even save more time by using message templates or printing reports and documents directly into Lysio to instantly send to clients. If you are ready to significantly improve your staff's focus, collaboration, and relationships with clients, 
head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Lysio. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash L-I-S-C-I-O. Lysio, everything you need to delight your clients and your staff. So I guess we're kind of talking about, well, we're talking about how to run a practice better on that theme. So here's something interesting kind of related to this. I was watching YouTube and a video popped into my feed from a channel I don't follow. The headline of the video was something like three ways to be more productive from an Amazon engineer. And I thought, oh, I like Amazon. I admire Amazon. I wonder what this engineer has to say. And his name is Steve Hewn. And he's a principal engineer at Amazon. Principal engineers don't have staff. They just are individual contributors, high level. Yeah, they're, just, they're, they're thought leaders. They think about code. They write blog posts. Yes, yes, yes. Well, so he has this channel, but his job is just like working on code at Amazon, right? Yeah. And um, so he said there's three things that make him productive. One, set aside several hours of focus time per day. And I thought you were going to say not have a staff. <laughs> 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 well, the first part was like set aside several hours of focus time per day. And I thought, well, how often does that happen in an accounting firm where you as like a high level staff contributor are able to do that? Like, I think that if we're going to make accounting firms like desirable places to work where people can be productive, we need to say. Right. So I need heads down time, four to six hours a day. Is that what he's saying? Several hours. So several to hours me, the, a day, not, yeah. not a week, like a day. No, a day. I, I block and, out every day. Yeah, and to me, that's like two to four for me personally. I I prefer to have an entire half a day where I don't have meetings, so I can say it's after lunch. Friday afternoon for me. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Well, and, and ideally, it shouldn't have to be on the weekends or nights, right? But that's what ends yes, up happening. That's what happens. Um, yeah. So I try to schedule most of my meetings like in the morning or in the late afternoon, so I at least have that midday block. And then he says, number two, once you have that time in your schedule, just focus on one thing per day. Like make your objective to get one thing done during that time. Uh, that's also challenging to do when you have like a million things going on. But you should be able to pick like one really important priority. So I know maybe in tax, that's like there's one big return that you got to get done that day, right? And you just say, I'm going to get that one thing done. Or maybe it's in outsourced accounting work, it's I'm going to get this one account reconciled and I'm not going to work on 12 different things. I'm just going to work on that one thing and I'm not going to be interrupted. And then the other thing, number three, is declutter your schedule or skip non-essential meetings. And so he just says, if you have lots of meetings on your calendar, because that's the kind of place where you work, where people just invite you to all sorts of meetings, he just says, just stop showing up. And if people really need you there, they'll, they'll say, hey, why didn't you come to my meeting? <laughs> I thought those were really good tips. And uh, it's something that we don't really, like, can you imagine an accounting firm partner encouraging staff to, you know, go offline for several hours a day so they can do heads down work? to focus on just like one thing and then to like skip meetings. But that's what it is. That's I think what it takes. Well, especially I think that's important for like firm owners, right? Small, yeah. Smaller, mid-sized firms because like you get caught in the weeds and you can't work on your firm. Yeah. And then a year goes by and you're like, I made no progress on my firm, right? And so I think, yeah, to, the, to be able to block this out and the, it, the problem is the discipline. And uh, there's a book uh, called The One Thing, coincidentally, and how you almost have to get your, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your employees to all buy into this as a system. Be like, you know, you have to explain to your spouse and your kids like, hey, by the way, if you ever call me between these two and a half hours, I will not answer the phone. Even if you were in a car accident, I am not answering the phone. Like you also have to, if not, people just, they, they erode it. You, yeah. You're really good at it for two or three days and then it erodes away. Then it erodes away. It's it's tough. It's tough to do. Uh, here's... Here's something related. We're talking practice management, right? Here's a tweet from Laurelyn, who I mentioned. Her good, the bad, and the ugly accounting podcast show is great. She surveyed Twitter back in September and said, all my self-employed accountants, how many hours per day do you work? Assume a five-day work week. And 6% of the responses were one to four hours a day. 31%, so almost a third, were four to eight hours a day. 38% of the responses, eight to 10 hours a day. So at or more than a full work day. And then a quarter of the responses, 25% were 10 or plus hours a day. And that's on average, judging by the way she phrased this question. Now it was during September, and I know that can be I get a, a busy period, but like if you're self-employed, 
isn't the whole point of being self-employed so that you don't have to work those crazy hours? Like to me, that is, that's the reason I want to work for myself is that I get to control my schedule. So why do we have 38% plus 25%? So, you know, 58 plus five is 63%. See, I can do second grade math. Uh, I have a second grader. 63% of self-employed accountants who, and this is 380 votes, right? So this is a large group, 68%. So two thirds are working more than a full day. Because I think when you, in a perfect world, you become self-employed and you would only do that job. <laughs> but you have, like, like, things go wrong and you're dealing with like other products your company uses and you're dealing with a billing problem. You're basically, the stuff, all the stuff that you need to do as a business owner, you have to still do. Yeah. And that's kind of work, but it's not the core function of your company. And that all starts to add up. And this goes back to my premise of like, where is the full service? Like, we'll take all that off your, your plate for you. So you can just do 40 hours a week of running your actual business, right? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, what you do, whatever whatever your profession might be, right? Yeah, my problem I mean, with that is- This goes back to why lawyers only charge two hours of billable time a day, right? And they like successfully collect on like 1.6 or 1.8 because they spend the whole rest of the day doing other stuff. I'm pretty sure they're billing it. all that other stuff to their clients too. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers are really good at billing. It's accountants who tend to eat their time more time, than yeah. attorneys. We could probably learn something, although we don't want to be but like- But they're not the good at collecting. No, they're not good like, at collecting. Yeah. Clio, yeah. Clio has, uh, the law firm software has all the data on this, so they're- they have all the data on how bad they are at billing for their time and actually collecting for their time. Lawyers are horrible, actually, at it. So there's a cost. That's a whole other show. Like, and here's the thing: I think we don't think about enough in accounting is when you're self-employed. The nice thing about working all that time is that comes to you. You make the profits, right? Yeah. You. So you're incentivized to work really hard, better than at a firm where they're just the profits go to the partners, but. There's a cost to that, which is you're not healthy because you can't go work out if you're working those 10 plus hours. The, t the quarter of people who work 10 plus hours a day, I don't know how you work out. Or do you have a family? Like, how do you spend time with your family? How do you do all that stuff? Because I haven't personally figured that out. Like, for me- You have to be, you have to wake up first and you go to bed last. That's the only way to do it. Yeah. But then you're sacrificing your health for your sleep, right? You're not getting enough sleep. Yeah. It's probably not getting enough sleep. And so, like, there, there's costs to all this stuff and we have to think about them. Everything else I have is app news, so I don't know where you, what else you might have that's not app news. Uh, Just some Bitcoin stuff again. TMZ reported an accounting story. TMZ did. Yeah, Great. Fat Joe is suing BDO. That's the headline on Going Concern, reporting on TMZ story. So I, I, I saw, I think I saw this go by on one of the twitters, and I was like, I don't even know who this guy is. Like who? I... Well, his name's Fat Joe. I'm going to assume he's a rapper. He's suing his longtime accountant, Andre N. Chamas, Chamas, C-H-A-M-M-A-S, and Chamas's firm, BDO, for a alleged misappropriation of funds. Oh, and he claims that BDO is running some kind of Ponzi scheme. According to TMZ's review of the legal documents, Fat Joe noticed, quote, some accounting irregularities, unquote, after... Uh, Chamis's assistant, Vanessa Rodriguez, was fired in July. Joe says that his wife, Lorena's name, was used to open Amex accounts and make huge unauthorized purchases, including $40,000 in charges for Uber rides and Uber Eats deliveries, as well as tuition payments for Rodriguez's daughter. Joe also claims he discovered one of his entities, Sneaker Addict Touring, was missing large deposits to the tune of more than $300,000. He says there were similar irregularities with other entities. Uh, as for the Ponzi part of the alleged scheme, Joe claims the firm also defrauded Jose in, uh, Inglesias of Colorado Rockies, Luis Garcia of the Houston Astros, and former Chicago White Sox player Dayan Visito. So he says. So basically, Ponzi, or is that just they? Com they he's, he's accusing them of committing some frauds, but I don't yeah. know how that's a Ponzi because a Ponzi is like you're selling people the dream oh. of making money off the next people you sell, right? So in the suit, this is how it, it's a Ponzi, I guess. So he says Amex accounts were opened under their names as well, and the money flowed between all of their accounts to keep the Ponzi going. So, I mean, it's it's not really a Ponzi scheme because they weren't paying kiting. dividends. It, it was kiting. Yeah, like they right. were yeah moving Before money around to, to trick it. But basically, so it sounds like BDO, one of these BDO partners, 
uh, or accountant had an assistant who was doing all this stuff, creating, you know, stealing money from clients. And uh, yeah, that's not good. Well, didn't we just talk about somebody else is trying to sue BDO because they say that BDO is a, uh, somebody didn't get the restaurant or shuttered doors venue grant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, uh, that was one of the comedy. Was it the comedy store? Oh, the store? comedy store. Yeah, they were yeah. saying them. Yeah. So it's, I don't know. I think I saw something on Twitter this week, you know, with the deadline. People are like, at the end of the day, you're responsible for your taxes at the end of the day. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of a, this is kind of the same thing. At the end of the day, you're priced responsible for your accounting. You're probably responsible for your taxes. Well, here's my takeaway from this. This has always been my fear as I hired people is, are they going to steal from my clients? I can trust myself not to steal from my clients, but how do I make sure my staff don't steal from my clients? And so I was always obsessed with having controls in place where nobody could send a check or make a payment without either myself or the client or ideally both approving it. And then notifications. Every time money goes in or out of an account that I'm managing, there's yeah. notifications going to the client. So nobody can say, I didn't know. I didn't see it, right? So even if we don't have a control before, we have one after. And I feel like a lot of times that gets skipped in firms. And then just, I, I, think, I think you get to a point where maybe you have so much money where it's probably wise to always have a second firm. Just, just hire an accounting firm just, just to audit the first accounting firm. Yeah, kind of in a way, right? Just like, yeah. hey, somebody else is doing all the work. I want you every ninety days. Just go peek at the work they're doing. Just peek at it. That's all. Yeah. You know, pop into the bank accounts, scan things, look for anything that's strange. Actually, there's an app here. All these people with all their AI. You got an app you could send to rich people, sell to rich people. Yeah. <laughs> Should we'll, we move into app we'll, news we'll now? We'll scan and make sure your accountant isn't stealing from you. Are we ready? Now, to we move? can't create this app because it probably makes us very. You know, not popular. Oh, in this oh you're industry, saying this is an idea. This, app. this is an idea for an it's app. It's an idea. It's an exist. idea. Yes, yeah. yeah, somebody could go build this app that, you know, they could call it like auditmyaccountant.com and you could have that as the well, app. I mean, one way to deal with this is just always set up apps so that the client has to send the payment, right? They have to push pay. Yep. So even if my staff are setting everything up, the client ultimately sent, you know, pushed pay, which, which is like signing the check. And, yeah, that doesn't happen though. Like in a lot of business management situations, with this, this sounds like a you know wealth management, business management, management family search, office yeah. kind of situation, where people will just like they'll set up accounts and they'll just start and then now I I spend your money for you, right? And that's yeah. always dangerous. It's it's always tricky, and you always get you there is inevitably fraud that occurs because there are internal controls. So this episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Relay. The other day, Chris Maskey of Prefix Accounting tweeted the following, quote, not so hot take. If your business banking cannot maintain a stable QBO connection, you do not, in fact, have a business account. That's a cheap knockoff of a real bank account, end quote. And I could not agree more. What's the point of a business banking account if it doesn't integrate with your accounting tech stack? Relay is a no fee online business banking and money management platform built for you and your clients. Relay integrates into your tech stack with direct integrations to QuickBooks Online, Zero, and Gusto, and improves your workflows by allowing members of your team to have their own set of secure login credentials to clients' banking data. No more bugging your client for two-factor authentication codes. And did I mention the ultra-reliable bank feeds? And your clients get powerful online banking features like 20 individual checking accounts and 50 physical or virtual MasterCard debit cards which can be assigned to their team members. To stop fighting with, as Chris tweeted, a cheap knockoff of a real bank, and instead get a business bank account that cares about you and your small business clients, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash relay. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash R-E-L-A-Y. I got more stuff that we can catch up on next week. It's just, it's fun to get through some of these stories. Like, well, there's the, I mentioned that one about the home run. With the big tax yeah, bill. Yeah, let's, at least you previewed that. So okay. Let, knock out the home run one, and then because it's baseball related, you could talk about Sage for a quick second, and then we'll go to Abnus. Yeah, well, so- Sage, is all, Sage and baseball, right? This is We were talking about baseball last week because Sage signed a deal with Major League Baseball to have the Sage logo on TV uh, during baseball games for stats and stuff. Uh, so here's a baseball-related story. We'll continue the trend here on the show. Uh, a man named Corey Humans 
may have snagged a six-figure tax bill when he caught Aaron Judge's record-breaking 60-second home run Tuesday night at Globe Life Field in Arlington, Texas. And I guess this was more than just Tuesday night. It was a few weeks ago uh, because we're catching up on this story. So Corey is a Fisher Investments vice president, so he's already doing pretty well. But the ball is worth potentially $2 million or more. And so the question is, well, when you catch a $2 million fly ball or home run, home run, not a fly ball, uh, you know, what happens? And so Bloomberg, actually, no, not Bloomberg, Fox Business uh, wrote in a story about it, about the tax rules uh, for caught balls, because they are, quote, as confusing as re- rules for the infield fly rule, unquote. The IRS declined to so comment. It's, it's not sound, okay, it's because it's not sounding like this is simple, like one day I'll sell it and then that cash will be a gain. It sounds very, like, well, so there's a question, like, do you have income or do you have a taxable, you know, is it taxable when you catch the ball? Uh, the IRS, which declined to comment for the story, has never stated its position on whether a ball becomes taxable when it leaves the stadium or when it's sold by the fan who caught it. The service has only said that balls returned to the team are not taxable to the fan. And that's a tradition is you return the ball to the team. They save it as, you know, a, a, a memento. Historical souvenir, document, whatever. Historical, yeah. right. And then usually they'll give you something in return, but probably not $2 million, right? So... Some tax experts say that catching a ball is a taxable event. They point to the 1969 court case, uh, Cesarini versus United States, Cesarini, I guess. A federal judge decided that a $4,467 found inside an old piano was a taxable windfall, much like winning a prize. Uh, but H&R chief tax officer, H&R Block chief tax officer, Kathy Pickering, disagrees She's quoted in the article saying that if you hold on to the ball, you won't owe taxes. But I don't know. Others seem to disagree with that. S- selling well, did, I mean, it. did they issue a 1099 for catching this ball? Like, how, does, how do they even know you have this ball? Well, I mean, TV. How do the IRS know? That you're on TV well, yes, okay. catching it. TV, you're but, in a news story. But if I find a suitcase on the side of the road with a million dollars in it. <laughs> yeah. And there's no record of it. Well, you're, you're still supposed to report that income, David. You know, like you, okay. you, you, if you don't, that's tax evasion because all, what is the phrase? I forgot. It's been so long since I studied it, but it's, you know, all income from whatever sources. So what if it's not cash and it's something, va- I find uh, some engagement ring. Yeah. That's a windfall. So that's so You have to claim it. Yeah. Now, you know, this question is, do, if you keep the ball until you die, does your estate owe tax? <laughs> but that only comes into play if your estate is worth more than 12 point. Uh, $12 million. And was this ball caught in New York or was it caught like in Houston or someplace with, like in Florida where there's less taxes? Like, I don't know. I wonder if there's a state implication. They were only talking about the federal one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you sell the ball, of course, then you have tax on that. But the question is, is it regular income or does it qualify for capital gains tax rate? <laughs> because there's a special tax rate on collectibles. And if you consider the ball a collectible, it's a capital gains tax of 28%. If you hold it for more than one year, if you keep the ball from for less than one year, ordinary income tax rates apply to the sale. So, and is it like gambling? So you can gambling, right? I can deduct all my losses in theory. Yeah. Can I claim like all the money I spent to ke- working my way up to catching this ball <laughs> that I spent at baseball games? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I, I'm going to say, I'm going to guess no. But okay. again, you know, I think, David, you should consult with your tax professional on this issue. Because uh, they're all in agreement on how this should yeah. be tracked, I see, from this article. So the last time this question came up with the IRS was back in 1998, when Mark McGuire, who played first base for the St. Louis Cardinals, tied Roger Maris's 1961 home run record. A sports writer asked the IRS whether Mike Davidson, the fan who caught the ball, was liable for tax. And an IRS spokesperson said Davidson owed gift tax because he planned to give the ball to McGuire. Can you imagine you catch the ball and now you owe gift tax? (laughs) (laughs) Who is this idiot IRS spokesperson, right? (laughs) The statement drew widespread criticism from the White House on down. Mike McCurry, President Bill Clinton's press secretary at the time, called it, quote, about the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, unquote. (laughs) That's poor IRS guy, right? The the IRS uh, quickly back down, declaring that no tax was due, no gift tax. They said that returning the ball is more like returning unsolicited merchandise than giving a gift. 
But you know, there's no firm rule on this. So, if you have a, if you're good enough tax attorney, or... oh, if you donate the ball to charity, you can claim a deduction. So it seems funny to me that if you catch the ball, right? Does this make sense? You catch the ball, and you, it's not taxable. But then you donate it to charity, and you get a deduction. How can you get well, a I deduction? Think TikTok. If you set up another corporation in Delaware, and then you put it in there, and then they make the donation. <laughs> Oh, yeah. If, if my LLC makes a donation, it's a deduction, right? Yeah. Yes. A anything through an LLC is deductible, according and to And I put Twitter. it under the name of my car, yeah. and then it all works out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we shouldn't feel bad about, you know, giving uh, ridiculous tax advice, David, because it's so bad out there. All right. Shall we get to uh, app news? Yeah, we can get to app news. I, I have an app news a, that continues on with remote work. If you want to go down that path, let's do it. So, Rippling, Rippling, and the, there are payroll app is not the right word, right? They, it's like uh, you hire an employee, and because of that, now you need to. It ripples into other parts of your company. You need to issue them hardware. They need to be onboarded to all the software you use, right? That's the ripples of hiring an employee. But and then like now, a month ago or so, they launched an uh, employee expense card type product. But right? now they're actually going after global payroll. So they've launched a global payroll. Uh, was it PEO? I always forget. I never do the. Yeah, PEO. It is PEO. Yeah, so PEO was... is when Rippling, if they have a PEO, they operate as the employer of record. So, you you know, if, if you've ever worked for a company that used Trinet, which I have, yeah. Trinet is actually the employer on the W 2, and they're leasing the yeah. employee to the Trinet customer. And so now Rippling's basically offering this globally. So they're going to compete with those other startups like Deal. Right, uh, remote, remote first. Um, so if you and I want to hire employees in other countries, Rippling can basically handle this whole thing for us. Now, uh, a couple of funny things from this article. Apparently, Deal actually runs on Rippling. Really? Which is which is interesting. <laughs> so so D, which is, you know, the the startup Deal actually runs on Rippling uh, for that. Um, but yeah, so basically now U.S. based companies can uh, hire and pay workers all over the world, full time or contract. And apparently you can onboard employees and contractors in 90 seconds and run payroll within minutes in everyone's and, local currency. And what countries can I hire employees in through this global PEO? It just says everyone's local currency and global <laughs> compliance. So, so every country in the world. <laughs> every country, it sounds like. So can I, I, I didn't see a list in the press release here. I'm looking forward to hiring an accountant in the Vatican. Uh, <laughs> if Deal supports that. Interesting. There's probably a few that are there. There's a lot of money to be counted. Oh, yeah. Um, what else is? Oh, that's so okay. That's really cool. I have to look at that. Bookkeep. We had uh, Jason Richardson from Bookkeep on uh, on one of the bonus episodes a few weeks ago. We chatted with him at Scaling New Heights. They had a raise of six point six million. Congratulations! And what I loved about their their press release on this is they um, they actually call out they call out Uber Eats. So they go on to say, while well, some software companies offer API access, many don't have the infrastructure or deny access, including some of the most popular platforms like Uber Eats. They specifically call that out. And really, it's calling out, and, and all apps should do this, all these big platforms that don't make accounting data accessible should be called out. And, and that's essentially what they're doing. And the other theme here is this goes back to some of the conversations we even had at uh, Intact about their, I, their importer for this Excel importer right, that tool. And this is kind of that same thing. So many people are still have legacy systems that are pumping out PDFs, CSVs, or Excels, right? And that's really where Bookkeep is really taking some leaps forward on getting all that data into the accounting systems. So They'll take it. So whatever, if you have some weird point of sale system, they're going to be able to, to take that export file from that point of sale, that Z tape maybe, and shove it into your accounting system. And that's where they're really filling that gap in need. Nice. So I, it's a, they, it was a sixteen six point six million dollars seed round. So David, a seed plus. I need yeah. to make an instant correction on our show today. Sarah, who is in the chat, said a PEO is a special designation that is not quote leasing unquote employees. So I guess I've always thought that with a with a PEO, right, the way it works is, I mean, maybe it's just a terminology thing, but that with a PEO, uh, you know, they're the employee of record, and then. I, the company, if I'm using the PEO as the employer, right? I, I pay them and they pay the employees. Uh, but I guess that the term that is preferred in the industry is co-employment. Co-employment. And leasing is, leasing is reserved for uh, temporary employees. 
But like, I feel like, uh, I feel like it's a terminology thing, right? Because I mean, the PEO is the employer. Well, good news for anybody that cares. I actually listened to a preview of the Oh My Fraud podcast last night that's going live today. Yeah. And that fraud is a PEO company, fraud. Hmm. And Greg and Caleb go very deep. And so you can get CPE credit, go listen to that podcast, and you'll learn more than you want to know about PEO companies. <laughs> like, so, so if this has piqued your interest, go listen to that episode that goes live. Uh, well, it'll go live before you hear this episode. So it should be live by the time you, you listen to this. And thank you so for the correction. Well, and so the difference is in a co-employment relationship through a PEO, the PEO does not provide the staff for the client. That re responsibility falls on the client. So the client has to bring the staff to the PEO. And that includes hiring the new talent after the PEO partnership is established, all that stuff. And then the least employees, right? That's where, let's say I want to use, I don't know, uh, one of those outsourcing operations in the Philippines that uh, are becoming popular and they go out and they hire accountants. And then I need an accountant for my work. I need a temporary worker for the busy season and they provide me a least employee. Maybe yeah, that's, that's different. Right, that's the, that's the yeah. right terminology. That's the difference. Okay. Here's a Microsoft Excel update. Power users. They're not finished. They keep no, up to I mean, Excel will never be finished, right? So the desktop version of Excel will soon support a handy task automation feature previously only available to users of the web app. So interestingly, the web version of Excel has been getting updates before the desktop version so now basically you can create, edit, and run Office scripts in Excel for Windows using the code editor and all scripts task pane. That's now in the desktop. I guess these are scripts that automate repetitive manual tasks. So I wonder how these are different than you know, macros, but I think, um, I think it's just it's like the next generation of macros is what this sounds like to me. I, I, yeah, I haven't seen it, but I, I imagine so, when you see the next generation, it's going to be drag well, and drop. It's going to be... It the, says that's Cody. It says, um, yeah. Once programmed, scripts can be shared freely across Microsoft 365 accounts. Office scripts in Excel let you automate your day-to-day -day tasks. Inside Excel, you can record your actions with the Action Recorder. This creates a TypeScript language script that can be run again anytime. You can also create and edit scripts with a code editor, and they'll be shared across your organization, as we said. Sounds like the perfect vessel for viruses <laughs> and malware. <laughs> all the, malware. All visual basics, all the scripts that were always in Excel. Um, um, have you ever heard of the app called Katana, K-A-T-A-N-A? -A? I saw them at a conference recently. Yeah, so they're like an ERP uh, platform that adds on. Um, really, It's really geared towards manufacturers, smaller manufacturers. So they just raised $34 million. And a lot of the, the reason for the raise or why they're growing is because of tech, the, the argument they're making, right, is because of 3D printers, CAD cutters, all this stuff that people have access to now, they can do really small scale manufacturing. And then if you think about the rise of all the online smaller marketplaces that exist, so your Etsy's and things like that, it's like the perfect combination happening right now. And ultimately, because of the relationship with China, this China is becoming less important in this grand, like everything must be made in China. It's some massive, gigantic factory anymore. Like smaller manufacturing is coming back to the U.S., which mm -hmm. is interesting. But I loved about their press release. They talked about what they're going to use with that $34 million. And they said they're going to, A, bring manufacturing software to the digital era, which will include the rolling out of, quote, unquote, more advanced accounting integrations. I'm like, what is that? Like, after listening, they're seeing the value in building better accounting information or integrations. They're going to spend money on it, which is great. Yeah, that's great to hear. Uh Shopify has added tax support to their product. Shopify is a very popular e-commerce platform for online stores and retail point of sale systems. They announced recently the launch of Shopify tax. What this product allows you to do is track sales in each state, parse through state requirements to determine when to start collecting tax, register with each state as required. It'll ensure that you are accurately collecting the right amount based on the specific tax rules that may apply to your store and your customer's delivery address. It will help you remit the right amount to the right jurisdiction at the right time with calculations based on the customer's precise address. They will stay on lookout for unexpected regulation changes. And you can get suggestions for the tax category that best fits your product. It's free for the store's first $100,000 in sales each year. I think that's really smart. And then and after this is that, Shopify, mm -hmm. Shopify, yeah, it's inside of Shopify. Stripe now. bought Stripe, Stripe bought Tax Jar, right? Yeah. Okay, got it. I'm sure, my brain. 
So it's free for the first 100,000 in sales each year. After that, a small transaction fee will apply per order in jurisdictions where taxes are collected. So I wonder who they're, if they're partnering with somebody on this. I don't know. You know, under the covers. So I think this is really smart because one of the big reasons that small stores don't sell online is because of the headache of sales tax. If I had a shop and I was selling locally in Arizona, and then I thought, oh, if I'm going to sell into California, now I got to do all this stuff and I don't make a lot of money. And most Shopify stores, I imagine, are pretty small, right? Yeah. Like that's who they focus on. It's really easy, cheap to set up, easy to start. By making it free- And the threshold's gonna... small, right? If I remember correctly, when we talked about Wayfair, right? The, it's, it's as soon as you hit $200,000 in revenue or something, you hit that whole new oh. Nexus tracking stuff, right? I don't think it's, I don't think it's huge amount, right? It, it, well, it's, it's a, it goes state by state. And okay. um, the problem is a lot of states, they'll set the threshold as like a revenue number or orders shipped. And often, if you're shipping like $10 widgets, you can yeah. hit that quantity number really fast before you get even close to the revenue threshold. And so then you have this filing requirement and you didn't really make that much money and it's going to cost you a huge percentage of your profit from that entire state just to file, to yeah. have somebody do it for you manually. So so uh, Irish, uh, I'm going to call this another accounting firm you know, with engineers, they're called Outmin, O-U-T-M-I-N. They just raised 1.5 uh, million, pa- uh, this is uh, euros. And they're in what's Dublin. interesting about them, I went to their website. Oh, go ahead. They're in Dublin, outmin.io. They're in Dublin. Yeah. What's interesting about them, if you go to their website, is they really lead, and it looks like a Dex or an auto entry style product. Hey, just upload all your receipts, your PDFs, your bills, just upload all your documents right? Thinking, oh, that there, there's, and they talk about how they use OCR and they scan and all that. What they really do is that's where it just becomes an accounting firm. It's like, that's, that's, you just upload all your stuff and they do it the rest, right? And they um, plan on, so they have 150 uh, small businesses already. They plan on doubling their headcount to 48 in the next 12 months. And what I like is one of their tabs, they actually just refer to it as a finance team as a service, right? Finance so again, team as a service. It's an accounting firm with engineers, but they're, they're leading with just the dot capture, Right, that that you know, like I think is some of these apps like to call it the pre-accounting, right? So mm-hmm. they're, just, they're just building the pre-accounting as their lead to bring people into their accounting firm in a way. So that's kind of one. How it watch. works: simply upload your documents. We'll process the rest. Unlock full visibility of your finances with a dedicated support team by your side. They've got a really nice website. This is something worth looking at if you are looking at building a new website for your accounting firm. Out min. O U T M I N dot I O. Yeah. And they're they're getting people in with the software and then offering the bookkeeping as an ongoing revenue stream. They've got a nice app, it looks like. This is accounting firms with engineers. You know, Bookkeeper 360, they do this as well. They have an app that yeah. provides you a dashboard. You plug in your QuickBooks file. And it's really smart because they use it with their clients, but also people will sign up on the QuickBooks marketplace and then learn about Bookkeeper 360's bookkeeping services through it. It sort of reminds me of how I built my bookkeeping practice on Zero, mostly doing Zero implementations. And then we'd catch the bookkeeping on the back end, and that would be a recurring revenue stream that really built the value of the firm long term. So this is having that that hook up front. And I like what you said, David, about it being a finance team as a service. That's actually a good mark. Like, I, I feel like I have not seen anybody refer to themselves like that. Mm-hmm. I've been to a lot of accounting firm websites, and I think but I, they'll say they'll say like out, that. outsourced accounting or client accounting services. Actually, this is what virtual t- CFO. But I think no. this is like finance. We're going to be your finance team as a service. I, I think it's I, an interesting uh, play on that. I, that verbiage. I really don't like client accounting services. I really <laughs> don't like that term that the AFCPA has chosen, CPA.com has chosen, because it's really meaningless to clients. Like, think about it. There's three words in there. Client accounting services. Client is meaningless to them because they're, it's, that's from the firm's perspective, right? It's yes, not from yes, the client's perspective. It's from the firm's perspective. Right. Right. And, and when you name something, it should be from the prospect or the client's perspective outside of your firm, looking inward, looking you know, at your firm, not from the inside out. So client is stupid. Accounting, well, yes, accounting is something that needs to be done, but that's not what they're shopping for. What they really need is a CFO or they need a finance department, or they need a controller, right? 
services is dumb because, yeah, obviously it's a service. Well, what what's the big firm that just made the top 100 that's not an accounting firm? What's the name of their- Your part-time controller. Yes, exactly, right? Yeah. Like, it's very clear <laughs> that's what, what the value prop is. Yes. That's what you're hiring. Exactly. You're hiring a part-time controller. It's genius. And that's why they yeah. have 400 employees now and they're a top 100 accounting firm. Like, And they're not even- they're not even doing like crazy complicated stuff with technology. We, you know, I talked with the founder of that um, firm on the Earmark podcast and he said, oh yeah, you know, we, we were just going to everybody's office most of the time until the pandemic. Like they, they, they weren't, yeah. like they were just doing really good focused accounting services in a mostly traditional way, but offering part-time flexible options. Like it's not that hard to do something that's different. Like you don't have to build your own app, I guess is what I'm saying. Like this is this is one way to do it, but the other way is just have like good marketing. Yeah. Uh, and not use the word cast. And not use the word cast. I think one last story we need to touch on. So Zero is raising prices in both US and Canada. I don't know if you saw that. I did see that. I got the notification. So, so they have, there are different plans. So early plans will increase by a dollar a month to $13 USD. Growing plans will increase by three dollars a month to thirty-seven USD, and established plans, I guess, established is like as an established business, right? Will increase by five dollars per month to seventy dollars per month. So, I mean, it's starting to inch up there a little bit. I think that was always the big value prop is like zero was so cheap, but you know, again, once you're established, they have freedom to raise the prices because you're not like you're not going to switch accounting to GLs. It's just too much work. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the freedom let's to raise see. the prices. I'm going to the QuickBooks pricing page and I'm going to the zero pricing page. I want to see what is that, what, how they compare these days. So you said established is going to be $70 a month. Well, so, so most zero companies, like if you don't need multi-currency or project tracking or expense management, which to me are not core, like GL function. Yeah. Yeah. I still think that these are, these three prices from zero are QuickBooks Spicing you get for the six month or the three month promotional pricing. I think these are probably about equal to that, but then QuickBooks is still probably twenty five percent more expensive. The the thirty four dollar a month plan is the one that most people end up using, which is um what's that going to? You said it's going up to thirty. That's going to go to thirty seven. Okay, thirty seven. So, and and what I liked, what I've always liked about Zero's pricing is they have this. Well, if you're an accountant, they have the cash book plan, which is like I don't know what it is these days. Twelve. 12 bucks a month or something. Uh, that's going up to $8 a month in US. Okay. It's going to cash book. Well. Yep. Okay. So that's amazing because you can just basically do GL accounting, connect to bank feeds and do write-up work consistently throughout the year. And that's so cheap to do that in QuickBooks. I don't even know what plan you'd need, what you could use. Simple start. It's, is really, it's, a, it's very expensive doing QuickBooks. $30 a month. Where yeah, where I think auto entry was able to do it, and then they would, you, you'd almost use that as your write up work, and then it would export straight out to your. You so know, that's that's where I feel like all that, but Intuit is kind of messed up with accountants. Is like offer a version of the product to accountants just to do the monthly write up with bank feeds, and we don't need yeah. invoicing for those for a lot of customers. Right? They're doing yeah. their own thing. We're just doing the write up work, or a version of that you just give for free for your pro tax customers. Yeah. Exactly. Like Allow yeah. me to build the GL for my clients and f- pull everything in. Yeah. Anyway. Again, it goes back to Intuit. You just have the one plan yeah. for everything. <laughs> well, David, we're at the top of the hour. That's all the time we got. I got to jump off and go to the first session of The Focus Firm with Hector Garcia, our new series sponsored by that Avalara great. that Earmark is doing. It's seven free CPE hours. Hector is doing a whole eight-part series about how to build a more focused firm better accounting practice management. So I'll put the link to that in the show notes. Anyone who's interested, you can catch the replay of the recording uh, for the first session and join us live for the other ones. And it'll be available both live and on demand and you can get CPE both ways. So Amazing. mm -hmm. I guess I'll let you go. David, if talk- somebody wants to find these things, Blake, how do they get a hold of you or find them? Uh, well, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Blake T. Oliver. How about you, David? I'm on all the socials at David Leary. All right. Thanks, David. Great talking to you. See you Good next luck. week. Bye. Time for the classifieds. Are you still paying 1% for ACH to receive money from your customers? With Uclick, you can pay as little as 30 cents per transaction. Uclick has two-way sync to both Zero and QuickBooks Online and gives you the features that the accounting systems lack. 
like installment plans, secure automatic payment setup invitations, automatic receipts, and allows access to other credit card merchant providers beyond the ones that come with the accounting system, giving you more control over the service fees that you pay. For more information and a 30-day free trial, go to ucollect.biz slash CAP. That's ucollect.biz slash CAP. Check out Hector Garcia's new app called Right Tool for QuickBooks Online. Instantly increase your productivity with keyboard shortcuts and more. It will save you seconds. The app is free at the moment in public beta. Check them out at righttool.app. That is righttool.app, R-I-G-H-T-T-O-O-L dot app. I don't care where you live in the United States. If you're a CPA, you have to take ethics continuing education. And I don't care who you are and where you live, you hate taking ethics continuing education. That's why me, Greg Kite, and my buddy, Adam Browd, we created a podcast called Drunk Ethics, where we unfold and uh, expose all of the inner secrets of not just ethics, but how to become more ethical and to promote ethical behavior at your workplace. And we do that while we are getting progressively more faced during the course of each episode. In each episode, we take seven shots every seven minutes. And so at the beginning, we are scholarly. And by the end, we are drunk yet still scholarly. If you're interested in this podcast, which I know you are, anyone can listen to the podcast for free. It's out there. You can find it. But if you want CPE credit for it, NASBA certified CPE credit, it is a premium course on Earmark. So if you're already a subscriber to Earmark, it's going to be more than that. But listen, it's worth it because of two reasons. First off, you know your company. You know your firm's going to pay for it and not you. And second of all, it's worth it, damn it. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.